Okay, um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and um, maybe say a little bit about assignment two here. So in general, these help sessions, I mean, I'm going to be, they're going to be more me here to be driven by people asking questions. So I'm not going to give a lecture or anything like that. Uh, just, just to say, yeah. So, so if you want to make use of these, uh, you know, please do join in on them if you can. Um, I did have one person um, after I had rescheduled uh, ask if they could do a different time Mondays at four. So <laughs> I might try one more time. Um, I, I hate to keep moving this around, uh, <coughs> um, um, but. Um, um, yeah, if you're seeing this after fact, I'll, I'll post an announcement again. Uh, four on Mondays is fine with me, uh, but again, the same rules apply. If um, if nobody objects, then then I'll go ahead and try that time. Uh, but but yeah, if if you are counting on this two p.m. time that I moved to, and hadn't objected because that was good for you, go ahead and and give an objection, and I will allow anybody to veto moving it once again. So. Uh, but I'll post an announcement on that. Um, so um, let's go over task two or assignment two then. Um, so uh, one thing I did like about moving these to Monday, so we can also talk about the problem sets if anybody wants to ask about those. So, you know, we are on what I think of as the usual schedule for the summer class here. Um, problem set two is due Tuesday, program assignment is due on Thursday, and uh, the, the test for the unit two, which covers chapters three and four um, is open Friday through Saturday. So uh, everybody has got a chance to see what the um, tests are like. So all the tests will be of that same format. Um, I did return back evaluations. I have some comments. I usually most of my evaluation is in the form of more extended answers. I, I don't exactly expect people to give that big of, of a written response, but kind of as I said in my announcement here, a lot of people should give more though than what they normally do on the problem sets or on the test written question. You know, so these are supposed to be. Um, um, a chance for you to kind of uh, uh, give me a written response to, you know, uh, um, to uh, defend your conclusion, your results. Um, and if, if the question had some calculation in it, you know, you should be careful if you just give me the answer. Um, if you're right, then, then I guess you're okay. But if you're wrong, you know, that, that's like a zero if I don't have any uh, if I don't have like your work, you know, so you should show your work leading up to an answer, even if it's a, a if it's a question that was like a calculation sort of question. So, so you know, I can give partial credit, uh, even if you made a small calculation mistake or even a big calculation mistake, if, if you kind of show you, if you show me the steps leading up to your final answer, and I can't really do that if you just give me, you know, this was the answer. So. Okay, anyway, let's look at assignment two here. I better close that. Um, so um, for me, kind of as usual, I usually like to use the PDF. So again, if you've got your dev box open up, uh, if you've got your dev box set up correctly, you should be able to go to your repository um, and get the PDF of the assignment um, description um, from there. So I'll open that up so I can refer to it here. Uh, make it a little bit bigger here. Um, so, gotta update the date on that. Forgot that. Um, so, I usually recommend you know make certain that uh, before you start the assignment, let's, let's go down the, to the the tasks here. Um, so. Uh, before you start the assignment, make certain that things compile and run um, and the unit tests are running, right? So let's go ahead and check that out here. Um, so uh, as a reminder for your dev box, um, you should always open up the folder at the assignment level uh, to get the build system to work correctly, in case you don't remember that. So I normally you know, do open folder um, and then navigate to the particular assignment. So we're doing assignment two here. And that's what you need to have open up in order to uh, do your make bill, your make all and your make tests and things. So, 
um, and um, so did I open the wrong assignment there? Um, hmm. wasn't expecting that to show up in my uh, my revision control there, so uh, I have to check that because uh, that's that's back from assignment one there. So um, I'm just gonna you, you might not. Well, if you're done with assignment one, it won't hurt anything. I'm, I'm gonna get rid of those so that I can so, so I can have my changes clean here on my source control. Anyway, um, so for uh, that, yeah, that's not my assignment too, is it? Process simulator. Uh, no, it is. So, so, so for our. Um, um, oh, did I? I didn't share my screen here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, um, make sure you kind of let me know if I'm doing something here. You can't see what I'm doing. Um, sorry about that for people watching the video later. Um, so anyway, here's what I'm seeing from um, uh, my desktop. Hopefully, you can see that now. Um, so once again, I mean, all I did was did a uh, maybe I'll close that off there and, and reopen that. Um, so after after opening up my Visual Studio and my Dev Box, um, your normal first step is to do you know to open the folder for the assignment that you want to work on. So assignment assignment two. Um, and here's our files for our assignment. So this week, uh, our unit this week, you know, we're working on uh, processes and threads. So this is a kind of um, the, the simulation for this week is a simulation of the round rob round robin scheduling portion of, of an operating system. So you have to add a couple of things that we can talk about here um, to uh, manage a set of processes. Um, and to dispatch a process um, and simulate it running um, and to simulate a process being interrupted, um, you know, having, having to wait on an event. So, so going back to a wait state um, and then for the event to be completed, to be completed. So it goes back to a ready state uh, where it eventually gets dispatched again by the, uh, the scheduler of the system. So anyway, before I start, you know, I, I usually, you know, you should check that everything. I'll always make certain your your um, code is compiling and running. So again, um, uh, we have Control Shift One um, should be um, um, associated with the Make Clean target. If you want to build from a clean state, uh, Control Shift Two should do the Make All um, and rebuild everything from scratch. Um, you know if you're building successfully, if you get back and, and, and it says that your terminal will be reused, right? If instead you either get uh, compilation errors um, or you get some sort of an error from the linker trying to link together the test or the sim executable, then you're not building cleanly and you have to resolve that before you can possibly run your test, right? Uh, but yeah, if you don't see any error, link error messages or, or compilation errors, and another thing, if it's a compilation error, you should, the, if, if your IntelliSense is set up, you should get the, the um, um, a link on your problems to where the compiler is having problems compiling something. So, uh, Control Shift three then to run our tests. So yeah, so this is normal. Um, they should run. It's just um, um, they'll be failing here. So there should there should be a total of ten test cases in this assignment. Um, and the first one that you'll be failing on will be line one seventy three. So so yeah, the first test case. Um, um, is all testing some of the simulation simulator setup, the process simulator setup that I have given for you. So your first uh, tasks are actually going to be starting in the second test case, um, or even oh, the third test case, actually. So um, 
So yeah, not down to the third test case. Do you have to be doing something to write code um, to be getting one of these failing test case uh, to work here? So, um, all right. So let's look at the um, tasks then. Let's, let's actually get into the assignment here maybe. Um, so kind of as a warm up, um, there's a couple of getter functions for the process simulator that you have to complete uh, just to get your bearings. Okay, so let's look at the process simulator class a little bit maybe. So like on assignment one, uh, we're using object-oriented programming here. The simulation consists mainly of this process simulator. So this simulates the, the scheduling process. So, so the management of processes um, on an operating system. Um, so we've got some idea of things like, um, uh, this time you're going to have to add actually some member variables and things, uh, but we've got some idea of um, like the system time. Um, we are going to be using round robin um, time slice uh, um, time slicing uh, in this simulation, which we which you should have read about um, in our textbook this week. So. Um, a little bit anyway. So 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 basically the idea is that. Um, um, when we schedule a process, it will only run for um, um, some amount of time that we allow it, that we schedule it for. That's called the time slice quantum. Um, and, and once it's run, that number of time slices, um, as as we talked about in our uh, like the 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 process state diagram, the the five state, two state, five state, and seven state diagrams um, in our chapter three this week. Um, so once it kind of exceeds, it, it would the, the process would be timed out. So, so we're going to be simulating that idea of a process being dispatched, running for a bit, um, and then timing out um, um, and being returned back to the ready queue. Um, and that timeout process is controlled by the time slice quantum here. Um, anyway, so, so these methods their const methods here. Um, these are all getters. Um, so kind of a common thing in object-oriented programming. This, this is just methods that allows us to get information from an object or a class. So in this case, uh, most of these are just returning back the, uh, the, the current values in these member variables. So if we ask to get the, the time slice quantum, um, we simply just need to return the time slice quantum. If we have to get the current uh, system time, you need to return the system time. Um, don't have all of these, but but uh, but well, um, I guess most of it, if we have to get the next process ID, um, there's a variable called next process ID. Um, so most of these are initialized. So let's look back at the code here again. So, um, um, so all these tests are using uh, a simulation um, object that's probably created that they all reuse here. So um, if you go back and look um, at the top of the tests, where is it? Um, there it is. So um, uh, before the second or third test case, uh, we, we create an instance of the process simulator. Notice that, that we initialize it with a five. So the only parameter, um, so, so this is calling the constructor for our process simulator. Um, and um, when you construct a, a simulation, um, um, you specify the, the time slice quantum for the simulation. So, so in this case, we're mostly using five for all the testing we're doing. Um, in our unit test for the, 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 the setting for the time slash quantum, but, but that can be varied uh, in this case here. I'm going to open up my outline here. Actually, I'm going to move that to the top here. So I think I mentioned this before. Um, 
the outline is a kind of a nice, uh, uh, fast way to move around here. So in particular, let's let's look at some of these functions now. So let's open up the .cpp file, start looking at some of the some of the implementation. So in particular, um, there's our destructor here um, and the uh, constructor. Um, so um, uh, oh, so I guess that was actually part of task one. Um, you actually have to initialize these things here. I got to reread. Um, So, so yeah, we don't give you the implementation of the constructor. So we have to kind of, uh, you, have, you have to actually implement the constructor or at least get started implementing the constructor. Um, and um, um, then you can, you can check that the constructor is actually working by um, um, implementing um, uh, these getter functions if they're not uh, implemented already for you. So, um, 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 so like I did on assignment one, I'll, I'll get people started who are watching this video. Um, but kind of as a first thing, maybe I'll move the header over here because right? I kind of want to see both the header now and the um, the um, uh, the implementation, right? So, given that we're that that the time slice quantum is a parameter of our simulation. Uh, you know, we want to initialize um, our time slice quantum, this given, um, right? So, so again, um, I, I talked about this last time. If this confuses you, you can um, um, rename this, right? So what I'm doing here, Um, is um, um, I'm passing, we, we pass in um, oh, there is so, so whenever we construct a, um, a process simulator um, using this constructor, which takes an integer as input, we pass in the initial time slice quantum. Um, and um, all we need to do in the constructor is make certain that the member variable called time slice quantum gets initialized to that value that's passed in um, when we construct a new process simulator, right? Um, so, you know, again, I encourage you to always use incremental um, development here. So, you know, I, I made a change in a line of code or actually two lines of code. So let's, let's check the compiling and running. I'll do control shift two to rebuild. Um, and control shift three then to run the tests. All right, so we're still building and running, which is good, but we're still failing. Um, oh, um, Um, we're still failing the the, line, the the test on 173, so, so we're not initializing the next process ID. Um, um, I'm surprised that I didn't have a test of the time slice quant of getting the time slice quantum here. So. Um, Um, oh um, yeah, so I guess I was testing that previous. So like that was one of the that was one of the getter methods that I must give you. Um, so so I guess you don't have to. Um, um, how was that passing there? Um, let me check this out. So let me let me comment that back out. So we're not actually initializing the time slice quantum here that's given on the constructor. Um, so if we build and we run, 
our tests. Hmm. Uh, that might be bad. Is there a limit on my scrolling? Um, I have to check this for people here. Let me try that one more time. So you always, you know, there's kind of a hint. You always want to, to find the first test that's failing here. Uh, so yeah, I am actually failing stuff before 173 here um, um, in the code that we gave you. Um, But uh, we seem to have a limit on the amount of scrolling that we can do here. Which is good, not good. I hadn't realized that, um, um, that there might be a limit, that you might be able to get all the way back up to the top of your test there. Um, uh, so, you know, <laughs> Most likely there's a setting for that. So, so for me, I mean, I'm not a big Visual Studio Code user, but um, uh, I'm gonna have to search for that um, um, setting here. Maybe the scroll buffer or something like that. Um, yeah, so there might be a maximum amount of lines here. I'm going to make that 10,000. Um, let's try that again. So, so you, have to, you have to search for like scroll back um, buffer size there. Um, Yeah, that's better. Um, huh. So anyway, so so some of the things I said kind of at, at the, the front up here is a little bit wrong because I wasn't scrolling all the way back up there. So I better make an announcement about that. Um, so pe people watching the, the video here, you, you do want to make certain that you can go back and see your very first test that's failing. And um, um, it should be the one on line 145 before you start doing any work here. I said the one on 173 because I hadn't realized I wasn't scrolling all the way to the top there. And the one on 145 um, um, is is in the um, um, this test case here. Um, so it's, it's the first one. So, so yeah, it's explicitly testing for the time slice quantum. Okay. So that makes more sense because um, I, I would I would have expected that I was testing for that. Um, um, uh, kind of as another aside here, I mean, you can, um, although, yeah, so there might, there might be a limit on the scroll back buffer for this terminal in Visual Studio Code, but um, um, I'm not certain if you have that same limit if you, if you use like a regular terminal here. Um, you can't always run your test by hand from a terminal with make tests. Um, just because I'm curious here, let me let me try changing that back to a thousand um, and seeing if that limit applies on both places here. Yeah, so that limit is in both places. So yeah, I definitely need that. We definitely need to um, increase that for people on this um, assignment, or you might not be able to scroll all the way back up to the uh, first test here that's failing. So all right. Anyway, once I got that figured out, let's go back to um, our first task here. 
So as I started, I was, I was kind of giving this to you. So, um, so I, we've probably got the some of these getter functions for you. So, so by initializing the time slice quantum and uh, saving and um, recompiling. And running, uh, we'll see that that. Uh, 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 oh no! Nope. So did we not save that, or am I wrong? So you also have to update the get um, time slice quantum as well. So let's look at the get time slice quantum next. Um, so yeah. So okay. So I didn't even give you the getters this time. So besides um, initializing the time slice quantum, you also have to return it. But, but yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is typical for getter methods like this, right? So, so we, we've got, um, um, we've got parameters of our process simulator class um, and some things that want to use the a process simulator need to get information about the current state of that object or the, the current state of the process simulator, right? So, I mean, we're mostly using these to test stuff um, but, um, but, but yeah, we want to get information like the, the time slice quantum setting, um, number of active processes, number of finished processes, uh, other stuff like that. So, so we need to initialize all that stuff. Um, so anyway, now that we've um, actually given an implementation for get time slice quantum, if we build And run, hopefully, that gets us so that we're now at least finally setting our time slice quantum and returning it. So, so we're getting past that test at 145. Um, but, um, but yeah, now we're not getting the next one, the next process ID. So, um, so yeah, these tests tell you what what some of these initial values should be, you know, so the next process ID um, should be set to one. So, so the first process ID that gets re returned from get next process ID um, should be set to one, right? So, you know, the, these, these aren't initialized. So if we go back to the, um, the constructor, the only thing that we're given um, In our constructor for the class is the time slice quantum. So that the, the time slice quantum has to be initialized to um, whatever we set it for when we start the simulation, when we create a new instance of a process simulator simulation. Uh, but but the rest of the stuff is just going to be initialized to uh, known initial initial values, and you, you know those from the um, the test here. So. Next process ID. Um, so, so process ID should start at one. System time should start at one. Um, number of active processes should be zero. Number of finished processes should be zero. So initially, before we start simulating any processes, we don't have any processes in the system. Um, and not all of these, like, like we don't have a, a variable for number of active processes. Uh, that's kind of on purpose, um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that here in a second, right? Um, but I would suggest for task one that that if if you don't have a a value for that, that um, um, don't don't add don't add a member variable yet for that. Just go ahead and fix the um, um, fix the um, uh, the getter method, like. Um, so, so, so you do have like a, uh, a number of finished processes, if you look in the header file here, uh, but we don't have like a number of active processes, right? So um, uh, you can go ahead and initialize number of finished processes to zero and return number of finished processes. But um, uh, maybe uh, until you get a little bit further, don't worry yet about adding like a number of active processes as a member variable, um, just, um, um, just go ahead and return the the um, 
correct value in order to get the test to pass, right? So just code to the tests here to get number of active processes. You know, so, so it's expecting a zero. So it should actually be passing that if you return zero um, for that here. All right, so that's the general idea for task one. Um, so you're basically um, trying to get all these tests in this test case, starting with the test for the get time slice quantum to pass, right? So you should be able to get all of these to pass by initializing the things in the constructor. Um, um, and, and like I said, I would recommend just initializing uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, member variables that you're given and don't add any yet. Um, and then also you, you, you'll need to um, fix some of these getter methods to actually return something instead of returning uh, like a default value or a stub value. You know? so, so again, I get next process ID shouldn't be returning zero. You've got um, the next process ID as a member variable, should, so it should be returning that, whatever the current next process ID is and so on. Um, all right, questions on that? So if not, then we can look at the rest of these. So the normal way that, that I do sessions like these when we're doing them face-to-face -face is, you know, I encourage people to actually be doing them uh, while they're watching, right? So, I mean, normally what I would ask at this point is, is yeah, is, are people ready for me to move on to uh, the, the next task or not, right? Are, are, are good enough and think, think that they are um, uh, understand the basic idea so we can move on and start trying to implement kind of task two here. So, uh, but yeah, we'll go ahead and move on here. Um, so the, the majority of this simulation in assignment two is we need to be implementing methods in order to simulate managing processes and moving them through the um, state transition diagram. Um, so we're mostly just working with the three main states, which are ready, running, and blocked. Um, uh, although, yeah, I mean, you also do have to handle new events being created um, and then um, processes um, um, being finished, so, so done events, okay? So yeah, to take a step back. So, so this simulation like before, um, um, runs by having uh, these sim files as, in, as input. So basically there's, there's um, if you look at one of these inputs, there, there's a bunch of events that can happen in the simulation. So new means that a new process was created in the system. So here with for this zero one sim, um, when the new happens, um, um, we need to create like a new process and add it to the ready queue basically, right? And, and, and you know, the first process should end up being assigned a process ID of one, right? And then later on, a second process is created. So process ID, process two is created with a process ID of two um, and so on. Um, we've got CPU events, which represent a, a CPU cycle happening, right? So this is um, kind of how the, the, the time slice quantum and the round robin um, um, the, the, the Ram Robin dispatching works here. So if, if process one runs um, and we have uh, five set for the time slice quantum after it runs for five times, if it doesn't get blocked or gets finished, so, so done is how, is how 
processes are finished out of the system here. Uh, but, but the other way that, that a process um, um, can end up giving up the CPU is if, if it times out. So in this first simulation, um, the first process runs, uh, assuming the time slice quantum is set for five, it runs one, two, three, four, five, and then at that point it's going to time out and we need to dispatch, we, we need to simulate it being uh, timed out um, and put back to the end of the ready queue. Um, and, and at this point, when the next CPU cycle happens, uh, process two should be at the front of the ready queue and process two, one was, was timed out and moved back to the end of the ready queue. So at that point, process two would get dispatched and we'll start running on the CPU until it gets blocked. So, so block means that uh, instead of the process timeout, it ends up going to the wait state like we talked about in chapter three. Um, at that point, since it got blocked, then, then uh, the next time we run a CPU cycle, uh, process one, since we've only got two processes in this simulation, are ever created. So process one would end up at the front of the ready queue and would start running for a bit. So, um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. So, so, so when the simulator is running, it's going to read this the simulation file one by one, and it's going to be calling the event the 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 methods that you have to implement to simulate doing these kinds of things, like creating a new event, uh, blocking an event on, on I/O, unblocking an event when when the thing it was waiting on um, occurs, um, simulating the CPU cycles, and so on. Um, so yeah, the second kind of task you have to do is implement the new event function, right? So um, so here, this might actually be the kind of the hardest thing you'll have to do for this assignment because there's there's a couple of things that you have to decide and, and do. Um, but once you make those decisions, then, then the rest of these, you'll be reusing the kind of the design decisions that you make. So um, you kind of do have to decide um, how you're going to implement a ready queue, how you're going to um, manage processes. So, so how are you going to keep track of the processes that are created um, and running on your system? Um, So let's look at the, the third unit test. Um, so, so my, my um, suggestion is that, is that you work on these kind of incrementally here. So, um, so yeah, you should be able to get these working by having the getter methods working and the, um, the constructor working. Um, so the very first thing we do on, on the next test case is we call the new event. Um, so the new event is just an empty function as you're giving it here. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, these are kind of the tasks that you have to do for it. You have to, to, to decide how you're going to represent a process because you need to be managing processes in the simulation. So you have to um, 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 create a new process, uh, give it the next process ID using, uh, using get next process ID. Um, um, uh, initialize the process with the current system time. Um, Um, and you need to put it into a ready state, um, and you need to have some idea of a ready queue to be simulating um, 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 which processes are ready. You might need another structure, a queue or a list to, to, to keep track of which processes are blocked. Maybe, maybe not. That depends on how you implement things here. Um, So for one, for example, if you wanted to just pass the next test, um, you could um, uh, 
uh, go ahead and call yourself to get the next process ID. So, you know, pres presumably, uh, you know, since this is the, this is the first time that, that this, you know, the simulation what should have been initialized up here and the next process ID should be one, right? But we're in the process of creating a new event. So once we get the next process ID, we're going to be um, um, uh, creating a new process with that process ID of one. So you might want to go ahead and increment the, the next process ID, right? So, right. So I'm giving I'm, I'm giving you some some stuff on the second one here, right? So, but but that's the basic idea. So um, by incrementing the next process ID. Um, this would pass this test because now we set the next process ID to be plus plus or to be one um, 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 before we return from creating, uh, you know, our new process. So um, now if we ask to get the next process ID, it should be two, right? Um, you know, you should, you should keep track of the number of active processes somehow. So the reason why I didn't have a member variable for that is, is you might have different ways of doing that depending on how um, you're going to keep track of um, your processes, okay? Um, but um, let, let, let's talk about processes here. So um, another class that you were given that you shouldn't have to make any changes to, uh, but but you've got to get, you, you've actually got more than the process simulator. You've got the process state. Um, and the, the plain old process here. So um, you need to be managing processes. You should be using the processes uh, given to you in the process class here. Um, so what you want to do is you want to create like a new process using the, the kind of these, the standard constructor here. So to create a new process, if you just tell it what the, 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 the time, the current time is, so keep track of when it starts um, and what the PID is to be assigned to it, um, this will create a new process for you, okay? So you can create this dynamically or statically depending on how you're going to do things here. Um, So a minimal example would be something like this. So this would actually create a process called P statically. Uh, we, we, we pass it the um, process ID that we're going to be assigning to it that we got from the get next process ID. Uh, we pass it the, the system time. So um, Um, so again, we're getting this from our class, our process simulator class, the system time here, or, or we could have, you know, maybe to be more consistent, I could have also used, you know, get system time, um, get, um, yeah, just get system time, which should be returning the same thing, the, the, whatever the current system time is, right? Um, but, you know, you need to, um, keep track of that, right? Because for example, um, um, you know, after we test, test some basic things, one of the things that you need to do is you need to implement the um, uh, get process, which is supposed to return um, a process, right? So, so somehow you need to save this in a process table, basically. So like we talked about in chapter three, you need something like a process table uh, or a process control block um, to manage your processes here, right? Um, So, you know, I would recommend, again, if you didn't look into using, if you haven't used standard template library containers and you didn't look into that, like I suggested um, on assignment one, you know, you should 
probably be using like a standard template library container that will make things easier here. Um, like a, a list or a vector, maybe um, you can probably use just a plain old array and you can try that right. Um, so, um, like as a first. Um, So kind of as a first hint or first idea, um, you could potentially create an array of processes um, and just keep track of them like that. And um, for purposes of the simulation, um, although I don't think I defined a constant, um, I will go ahead and, and say that um, Um, uh, if you want to get started trying to use this as like a statically allocated array, um, uh, we won't ever say, we won't ever have simulations with more than 100 processes in them. So you're safe to go ahead and have like a upper limit um, on um, a statically allocated array of processes. Uh, if, if you want to try that as a first um, approximation for your process table or your process control block. So, um, Right, so this will allow you to get started. Right, so this this would allow us to have up to 100 processes here, um, and uh, I think I discussed this in the assignment description. You know, so since process ID start at one, you might want to just use process ID zero as kind of a dummy, um, you know, or ignore that. Right, so you could you just start at like index one, uh, just index this by the process ID. Um, Right, so that should kind of give you a minimal thing. So we initialize and create a new process, and this will actually copy the process um, into your process table, or it should that that information. But but now your official process is actually living in the static process table here, right? Um, and um, we should test that this builds and runs here. So, so again, I'm, I'm breaking my um, um, dictate to you guys. You know, so always try to practice incremental development. Um, so, so we have implemented a few things now. Um, so let's try compiling and running that here. You know, so at a minimum, you know, this should be passing my test at line 173 here. Although it's not going to be passing some of this stuff because I didn't show doing um, these things here, but. Um, So let's see if I have any compile error, compilation errors here. So we're still compiling, I think. And we'll run that. Um, so yeah, our first failing test is 146 here, um, which is not surprising. Um, so, um, Uh, because I because oh yeah I'm, I'm um, oh yeah yeah this is still not going to be passing this here either because I didn't I didn't implement the getter method even though we are um, um, initializing the next process ID and incrementing it so anyway um, so yeah I might want to implement that getter method there so but then yeah as as, as kind of a hint um, we should be able to actually implement get process just with the simple idea of a process table that we've given here because get process um, if we give it a PID like one, should return a, a process object, um, right? Or it actually returns a reference to a process object. Um, so, so yeah, you don't want to return like a new kind of default um, uh, empty process. You want to if I ask for process one and process one is in the process table, you want to access your process one and, and be actually returning that um, uh, here. So. All 
All right. And, and yeah, I'm going to have to kind of wrap this up here after just getting through task two. So the other thing, but that, that was a pretty big hit for those who watch this um, um, video, you know, so that was, I mean, there's, there's kind of two things. You have to have a process table, but you're probably going to have to have something separate as well to represent your ready queue. And maybe also a third thing to represent your, your blocked list, your list of processes that are currently blocked. Maybe, maybe not, but um, uh, you know, so for your blocked list, uh, you, you could just um, search to give you a hint on this. Um, so, um, close some of the stuff up here. So, um, with my process table, um, if you're doing things correctly, I could just search through all my processes. So, so when I get like a um, um, uh, an event that the uh, the event that something might have been waiting on occurs, you could search through the process table to find the process that's waiting on that and and put that back into the ready state and put it onto your ready queue. So, so that might work for blocking and unblocking events, uh, processes on, on events. But that won't really work for ready for, for uh, processes in the ready state because you really do have to have a ready queue because you have to keep track of which process ended up in the ready queue first, which process ended up in the ready queue second, third, and fourth, and so on. Right. Um, and, and here, um, you know, I really would recommend learning how to use um, the standard template library and use queues from the standard template library, maybe, or, or maybe use lists as queues, um, which would allow you, you know, so that when you have a new event, you can push that new event um, to the end of your ready queue. Um, if it is like a standard template library queue or a standard template library list, you can use like the push or the push back to put it onto your ready queue, right? Um, I mean, if you really want to, you could simulate a queue as like a process. And since since I'm guaranteeing that you won't have more than 100 processes, you know, you could use a, a, an array. I would recommend that you use like, um, like whether you're using like a list or a STL queue, or like an array that you just keep a ready queue of process IDs, uh, which are just integers um, in this simulation. So, so the PID type is really just a, de um, um, a type def. Um, so, so if you look in the process.hpp file here, um, 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 you'll find that process identifier is just a type def for an unsigned int, right? So, so anywhere you see PID um, or these other things, um, it's just kind of like a symbolic name or a more readable name for really just an int type, right? So, um, I mean, if you wanted to, you know, you could keep an array of PIDs, which, which again are just ints. But if you do that, you're, you're going to have to, you know, handle, you're going to basically go back to like a data structures class. You're going to have to actually implement a queue. So you have to kind of handle, okay, putting values on the end of the queue and keeping track of where the end of my queue is. And then when, when uh, I need to dispatch an item from the front of the queue, taking the item off the front of the queue and keeping track of, of the item of which index of my array is the front of the queue. Um, that kind of stuff from, from a data structures class. So, so yeah, you probably really don't want to go back and be re-implementing basic data structures like queues and stacks and things. Um, so you probably want to, at this point, if, you've, if you haven't looked into using STL containers, um, um, be using like a, um, uh, um, um, like a queue of, of, of um, For example, have a um, 
a, um, uh, a standard template library Q type. Um, um, so you, you'll have to include, you know, if you want to use queues, you'd have to include uh, queues from the standard template library. There. So I should go away after I include that. Um, anyway, something like that. So, um, and and yeah, and then you can just keep like a, a queue of process identifiers, for example. That's a pretty simple approach, right? And then you can push and pop things onto your um, your queue like that. Um, So um, I wonder why it's not happy with that. Uh, that should work. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm doing the I'm doing the syntax wrong. So these are standard template libraries. Now I remember. So. Um, Just remember my syntax. That should be better. There we go. So you you want a queue container that holds process identifiers, just as an example. So, there we go. Um, all right. So yeah, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, so just real quickly, I mean, there is more. Um, um, so, but the rest of this, once, the, like I said, that's kind of a big decision point there. Um, and, and yeah, maybe, you know, don't be afraid maybe to start with the simple thing, like, like an array. Um, but then, you know, as you do things, you might find, you know, that, that you want something a little bit more sophisticated. So using like a container, like, like standard template library containers um, for things, you know, but that should get you started. But then the rest of these, uh, depending on your decision on how you're representing your process table and your queue data structure, and maybe your um, um, your block data structure, um, the rest of these will have to use those data structures to, to simulate, you know, dispatching a process. So basically, what happens is, anytime the CPU becomes idle, the dispatch method will be called on the simulation. Um, and you know the pseudocode for that should be if you have your ready queue, you should look at the front of the ready queue. If there's you know if, if the ready queue isn't empty, then you should pop the the not pop, but you should take remove the item from the front of the ready queue um, and make it the current running process. Um, so so it'll be the one that's running on the CPU. Um, and if the if the ready queue is empty and dispatch is called, then the 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 simulation is going to be idle for one CPU cycle. There, there's no process that's ready to run. So, so the system goes idle for um, a clock cycle. Um, CPU event simulates a basic clock cycle um, or, or, you know, um, um, so, you know, you should implement, you should increment the CPU time by one every time the CPU event occurs. Um, And um, so for here, yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll want to uh, use the methods in the process class uh, for a lot of this work. Um, so every, every time a CPU cycles, you should be calling a method on the current running process to increment its um, 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 amount of time used. Right, so that's how to keep track of its total time and its time used in the current time slice quantum. Um, so yeah, so, so um, the the timeout method um, 
should be calling a method on the current running process to see if it's if its current time slash quantum has been used up or not. Uh, and that that method for processes is called is quantum exceeded. Right? Um, so if it's time slice and slice quantum has been exceeded, um, you have to simulate timing out the current running process, which basically means the process has to be returned has, has to be set back to a um, a ready state, um, and you have to push that process back to the end of your ready queue. How, however, you're representing your ready queue here. Um, Um, and then block event and unblock event are for the other kind of part of simulating process states. So the other thing that can happen to the current running process, I mean, besides it timing out, is it could become blocked. So and if it becomes blocked, you have to, to do the right things to put your process into the block state. Um, Um, and, and the corresponding thing is if, if an unblock event happens, you have to search among your currently blocked processes um, and return it back to a ready state according to the state transition diagram for processes that we talked about in chapter three. So, um, and again, I mean, you know, you could do this like with a simple search through your um, process table or it might be more efficient or make more sense to you to use a um, separate data structure, a list or something um, of just your processes that are blocked. So. Uh, and then finally, done event. Um, so the, the, the last thing that can happen to the current running process is it might be finished, it might be done. So if the done event occurs, you need to cause the, the current running process to exit. So. Um, So, so yeah, this, this is relatively, you just need to remove the, the process from the list of active processes so, um, and return the CPU back to an idle state. Um, all right, so yeah, I've gone beyond kind of what I, I wanted to discuss here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up here. Um, I've only got one person here, but, uh, but yeah, if you have questions, uh, let me know. Um, Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and maybe stop the recording. Uh, as usual, for uh, uh, people watching this after fact, you know, um, uh, send me questions if you want by email. So it will probably be the fastest response um, as you're working on things. Okay. Um, yep. So I, I think that'll be it for this recording. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, and um, yeah. And um, um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be, well, I'm going to be asking to see if people want to, are okay with moving this yet again to four. So look out for that. Um, and yeah, that's it for this recording. Then.